Hello everyone, my name is Stefan Soroyu and I'm a researcher at Microsoft. Today I'll be presenting Panopticon, which is our proposal for fixing row hammer once and for all. Panopticon requires no changes to any hardware components other than DRAM. While some DRAM today offers forms of row hammer mitigations, these mitigations are incomplete because they can only stop certain limited forms of row hammer attacks. In contrast, Panopticon is a complete row hammer mitigation. If properly implemented and configured, no row hammer attack can bypass Panopticon. We open sourced a simple simulator of Panopticon on GitHub at this link. Before I begin, I would like to make two quick points. First, throughout my presentation, I will sometimes use RH to denote the word row hammer. And second, I'll assume you're familiar with DRAM and Rowhammer. Unfortunately, I will not present this in my talk due to time reasons. If you're unfamiliar with DRAM or you're unfamiliar with Rowhammer, you can find many presentations online on these topics. We have our own presentation from an earlier project at this link, but there are really a lot of good presentations you can find online. This is joint work with Tan Bennett, who is the lead designer of Panopticon, Alec Wolman, and Lucian Kozokar. And all this work was done at Microsoft. Nearly a decade after the first Rowhammer publication, DRAM remains as vulnerable as ever. Rowhammer is not limited to a particular type of DRAM. It affects all types of DRAM, whether DDR, LPDDR, or GDDR, or pretty much any type of DRAM out there. Recent work has shown that DDR4 DRAM is in fact more vulnerable than DDR3 and that newer DDR4 is more vulnerable than older DDR4. The point to take away is that in general, newer DRAM is more vulnerable to Rowhammer than older DRAM. The research community has proposed many mitigation schemes, but unfortunately complete mitigation schemes that fix all forms of row hammer are not yet deployed in practice. We believe there are two reasons for the lack of adoption of complete row hammer mitigation schemes. First, these schemes still come with cost and performance downsides requiring a significant amount of additional memory like CAM and SRAM. This is considered quite expensive by hardware vendors. A second practical barrier is that most require changes at multiple hardware or software layers, such as changes to both the DRAM devices and the memory controller, or to the memory controller and the RCD chip. Costly changes across multiple layers are difficult to implement in practice because they require the cooperation and agreement of multiple hardware and software vendors. This paper presents Panopticon, a complete row hammer mitigation that is both inexpensive and in the case of DDR4 requires no changes to any hardware components other than DRAM. Panopticon monitors all row activations inside the DRAM itself. The main idea of Panopticon is to implement simple counter mats inside DRAM devices in a way that each row in DRAM has a corresponding counter. When the counter reaches the row hammer threshold, Panopticon performs a mitigation. The main mechanism in Panopticon is the use of an open space, staggered counter mat design that leaves ample space for the counter increment and logic. And all of this is done in DRAM. Panopticon has several benefits over previous schemes. It doesn't need large amounts of fast memories. Unlike prior work, it doesn't need to implement a separate counter lookup circuit. Instead, it reuses DRAM's row decoding logic to access the counter for the activated row. And finally, in the case of DDR4, it requires no changes to any components other than DRAM. It should work with commodity DDR4 memory controllers. This is an outline for the rest of my talk. I just finished presenting an introduction and the motivation of Panopticon. Next, I'll present in a little more depth the prior work and describe its shortcomings. Most previous approaches can be classified in four categories. First is tracking approaches. These approaches track microarchitectural events associated with row hammer, such as a DRAM row activate or a cache miss, to detect an ongoing attack before it has a chance to succeed. Next is sampling approaches. These approaches randomly sample the same microarchitectural event. Then they proactively perform a row hammer mitigation on each sample. Third is partitioning approaches, and these approaches compartmentalize memory and isolate an adversary from other co-located potential victims. 
When the memory is properly compartmentalized, a raw hammer attack in one memory perimeter cannot affect collocated potential victims. Finally, we have clean slate approaches. These approaches require significant changes to the memory hardware, including changes to the DRAM fabrication technology, DRAM devices, or DIMMs. The fundamental nature of these changes eliminate the threat of raw hammer by design. Now, in this talk, because of time, I won't be covering these three approaches, and instead I'm only going to focus on the tracking approach. Let me explain why current tracking approaches still have significant cost overheads. Most proposals aim to figure out how to use fewest possible counters to track all rows in a DRAM device. To accommodate this sophisticated logic, these schemes require CAM or SRAM to implement, for example, a counter lookup table or a hashing table. For example, Graphene is one such state-of-the-art tracking scheme. Graphene is quite impressive. It requires only about 2,500 bits to track an entire DRAM bank. That's on the order of hundreds of thousands of rows with just 2,500 bits. That's impressive. Unfortunately, this modest overhead quickly adds up due to the large degree of parallelism found in DRAM. This table shows the state overhead for DDR4 of three modern tracking approaches, Graphene, Blockhammer, and TWICE. Like I said before, Graphene requires up to 2,500 bits per bank. But the channel can access up to 128 banks, and a CPU can have up to four channels, so the per CPU state is now more than 150 kilobytes of CAM. Blockhammer and TWICE require even higher overheads. While not unsurmountable, these overheads are still significant. The second problem with tracking approaches is that they require changes at many layers. Most of these schemes implement their logic outside the DRAM device, either in the memory controller or in the RCD chip. Unfortunately, such approaches preclude the ability to refresh victim rows without the cooperation of the DRAM device. By tracking aggressor rows, these schemes cannot identify the affected victim rows unless they have visibility into the DRAM's internal physical row mappings. DRAM vendors regard internal row layout and the mappings of logical to physical DRAM rows as proprietary and confidential and are unwilling to share them even when they could help with mitigating row hammer. Instead, prior works propose a new DRAM command called nearby row refresh, by which the memory controller reports an aggressor row's address and instructs the DRAM to refresh all potential victims. I am now going to give a high-level overview of our approach, Panopticon. Let me start with how tracking works. Each row has an associated counter. Here, we're using a 60 gig counter, but any, any, any uh, appropriately sized counter would work. In this example, I'm showing four rows, rows zero through three, and each row has a counter tracking the number of row activates this row has received. The counter values are shown in hex. There is also a threshold bit, P10 in our example. Whenever a counter value increments, if the increment toggles bit 10, then the row address is added to a service queue. See that the DRAM receives a row activate of row address hex 2. This increment toggle bit 10 from 0 to 1 because the value changed from 3FF or hex 13FF to hex 1400. We add the address, the row address 0x2, to the service queue. See that next we receive a row activate of row address hex 0. This increment toggle bit 10 from 1 to 0 because the value changed from, X, from hex 87FF to hex 8800. We now add, add the row address 0x0 to the service queue. Next, I will show how Panopticon performs the mitigation. To service row hex 2, the DRAM device must refresh all potential victim rows. In this example, we assume the aggressor row can affect up to four victims. So in this case, we refresh victim rows hex 0, hex 1, hex 3, and hex 4, and we dequeue the aggressor row, row hex 2, from the service queue. The service queue now still has one more entry in it, the row address hex 0, which has not yet been mitigated. Panopticon needs to address two challenges. On this slide, we describe challenge number one, when to service the queue. We envision two possibilities. One option is that upon receiving a refresh command, the DRAM repurposes some of its time to service the queue. A second option is that the DRAM asks the memory controller for additional time, like put the controller on pause. Unfortunately, no DRAM protocol lets DRAM ask for time, although we think this is a must-have feature 
for all DRAM protocols. However, in DDR4, DRAM uses alert in to signal errors to the memory controller. Upon receiving this signal, the memory controller stops issuing new DRAM commands and instead reissues the old memory access. Panopticon retrofits alert N to effectively trick the memory controller to pause issuing new, DRAM, new DDR commands. By making use of alert N, Panopticon requires no modifications to any hardware other than DRAM itself. Now we come to challenge number two. While the counters are all stored in DRAM and that's great, where are we gonna, going to store the queue? Now for the service queue, Panopticon does use SRAM. However, this queue is small. In our performance evaluation of Panopticon, we used a queue of eight entries per bank. But the DRAM vendors can size their queues as small as needed, even to a single entry for the entire DRAM device. Panopticon will still work. When the queue is full, the DRAM stops and asks for time. We think this provides a nice way for DRAM vendors to differentiate themselves. For example, a large queue size makes DRAM have better performance because the larger the queue is, the less need to ask for time. However, and this is very important, even with a small queue, Panopticon is still safe. I'm now going to describe the DRAM architecture of Panopticon. This slide shows cell mats. And uh, for those of you who are less familiar with DRAM, let me try to explain this picture. There is a full length cell mat here uh, uh, on the upper half and the other full length here on the bottom half. And this cell mat is very, very long. I'm actually just showing, I'm cutting it and showing just a portion of it. It goes down a lot and up a lot. And we have what's called dual sided sense amplifier because they bridge these two cell mats and connect to either the upper or the lower data arrays, depending on how the DRAM circuit is activated. Now to select which mat we want to actually activate, this is done with a whole bunch of signals, the EQA, EQB, and the isolation signal ISO A and ISO B. Now Panopticon must keep the same spacing for the sensing and rounding of the counter bits that round beside these full end mats, and we want to use the same row lines to be able to basically activate the counter at the same time when we activate the row. Now this slide shows a cell mat, and what we're going to do with the cell mat, we're going to remove one of the mats, so we're going to now have open space here, and I'm going to show you what we're going to do with this open space. These sense amplifiers are not double-sided anymore because we don't have a mat here, they're single-sided, and we're just going to have a counter mat here at the bottom. Now this picture puts everything together. In the middle, we're showing the tall data mats, and you can see the tall data mats here. Uh, and on each side, we have double-sided sense amplifiers that select which mat to actually activate. There are lots and lots of cells between these edges. You know, I'm, I'm not showing them here. And we have these global row lines, actually, that run from one side to the other. Now, staggered, we have the counter mats that are actually half-sized and only support the half number of rows. This counter supports these rows here, and this counter supports these rows here. Now, when we actually make the size of the counter mats in half, that has two important benefits. First, the half data, half length data lines of offer lower latency for counter increments within the time needed to read the data cells. Now, when we activate the upper mat here with the data cells, we have to allow for enough latency to be able to reach all the way to the far end of the data mat because this is half, we now have much better latency properties here, so we have time to actually perform the increment. The second benefit is that, is that it creates this open space, uh, uh, spaces adjacent to the sense amplifiers where we can put logic for incrementers and also for testing. And this location is ideal because it has access to all the process layers, including the interconnect to create the logic needed for controlling and operating the incrementer. We also performed the security analysis of Panopticon. We wanted to understand how difficult it is to create undesirable scenarios for DRAM, such as placing rows in the service queue during several consecutive back-to-back -back refresh intervals, or TREFIs, and filling up the service queue. Are these undesirable scenarios difficult? The answer to both of these questions is no. Attackers can create both of these scenarios with relative ease. However, and this is very important, as long as Panopticon can put things on hold and ask the memory controller for time, the DRAM remains safe. Panopticon is a complete in-DRAM row hammer mitigation that is both inexpensive and for DDR4 requires no changes to any hardware components other than DRAM. For more information, please read our paper and see our simulator code on GitHub. Thank you.